Um, and with that, we're going to jump right into our text. As you guys know, we've been in a series called Dear Church, where we're going through um, the seven letters of Revelation. And each time, you know, it's Jesus Christ speaking to the churches, giving them a specific message. And we do, we do believe that it is so applicable for, for us even today. So today's message title is called Reputation Isn't Everything. And our text is going to come from Revelation chapter 3, 1 through 6. I'll read the word. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For, how, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. And I, I will never blot the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear God, I just pray that you may open up our ears and our hearts to be able to receive your words, O Lord. And I pray that you may place a true seed of faith inside of our heart that clings on to Christ, O Lord, our only hope for salvation and our only hope for anything in life. And Lord, I just pray that that real seed, O Lord, may sprout and we may have a beautiful, real relationship with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we live in a world where um, we can paint a picture of our lives in whatever way we want, exactly how we want, um, you know, because these days perception and reputation has really taken over reality I mean, as long as we can paint a picture of something to the public, and as long as they believe it, I mean, it's, it's basically become reality, you know, whether it's for ourselves or our situations or anything. Politics have used this tool a lot. Propaganda, it's real. Commercials use this all the time, right? All you need is a few testimonies from a few people and maybe one, one case study from a guy that kind of has kind of the perception of authority, and then you got a following, you know, as I was writing this sermon, I was reminded of when I went to teach English in China for about a month. And this was during the time I lived in Korea for about a year. And I taught in two schools in China. Um, one was in a city called Yangbian, and another one was a small little town. I forget the name, but it was across the Tumen River. And if you guys don't know, the Tumen River is a, is a small river that separates China from North Korea. And it's, it's really a small river. I was like, shocked. I was like, I can swim across this. I'm not even a good swimmer. And, you know, during that time, it was the winter, so you can actually walk across it because it was frozen. And, you know, uh, being a guy from America, I'm just like, yo, Korea's dying right now, right? They're, they're starving. And I was like, I expected to see little huts and people starving or something. And, and you know, I was asking the students about it. And they're like, yo, let, let, we'll, we'll show you what, what it looks like. So they took me up this big hill um, that looks across the river. And you can see the different towns in North Korea. And, you know, there was this one particular area that was kind of, like, lively looking. You know, it looked like a new college campus or something. And I was like, yo, what's that over there? Like, what's going on over there? And they, they looked at me and smiled. They're like, it's empty. And I was like, what do you, it's empty? It's like, how do you know it's empty? I was like, why? Well, you know, at night there's no lights there. Everybody knows that it's kind of there for show. And, and you know, she was like, she was like it, you know, I, I kid you not, every night I looked over, it's all dark. I don't know if it's like a national policy or something, but they were like, hey, everyone knows that they want to make their country look good, especially along the river, but most of them are dead. And it's interesting that even a young student, I mean, she was probably like 13 or something, she understood that, uh, that it was keeping up with her reputation even though things weren't really there. And this is, not, this is not something unfamiliar with us, right? We do this on all different levels. I mean, we tend to care about our reputation more than anything else. Gosh, you guys remember in high school where they, we had this word that we always worked for? Rep. What the heck is that rep? We worked for rep. We fought for rep. You know, we, we spent all our money for, on expensive clothes with little logos for rep. To hold that rep. Begged our parents for money for rep. You know, I remember telling my mom to drop me off a few blocks away from a party just so I can walk there and not, for them not to see my mom for rep. And I can only imagine what our younger generation goes through to hold on to that rep. 
I wonder if it's harder or easier. I don't, I don't know. Social media has changed everything. You can be whoever you want. They got so many different apps to make you look pretty. And maybe it's easier to live a lie. I don't know. And there's nothing wrong with holding a reputation. Reputation oftentimes keeps us accountable. It helps us to strive. And not to care about reputation at all can be a problem too, you know. But there is a sense, right? If it's not followed up with reality, if, it, if, if, if it's something of just like an act or a mask that we put on, especially if it's prolonged, it begins to eat away at us and kill what's inside of us. Because it becomes all about what we can show on the outside while our souls are contained and hidden and we're actually dying inside. I mean, think about this. You know, I couldn't help but think about this because it sounds like the description in our text. I mean, check this out. The church of Sardis. These are, this is what Christ is saying for the people living in Sardis. In verse 1, it says this. It says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. I see your deeds. I see them all. I see everything that you do. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're, I mean, what a thing to say, you know, like, I, I, I mean, what if someone came up to you and said that like, oh, you're pretty, you're beautiful, you know, you're giving them compliments, oh my gosh, you're, you're so pretty, but only on the outside, oh my gosh, it's like a backhanded compliment, you're like, what? See, the church of Sardis had a reputation of being alive on the outside, it was beautiful, it was fun, it was hospitable. They probably served the church, uh, served the, the people around it. Everyone was super nice. Um, history says that it was a very peaceful type of, of city. But in the inside, it was said that it was dead. And the s- description of the city kind of came from the fact of different, you know, areas uh, of his- the historical background of Sardis. I mean, they had a long history of a great reputation. I mean, their city was known to be untouchable and impregnable because it had walls around everywhere. And it was not only that, it was, a, it was literally like a citadel built on top of cliffs. So they had walls and cliffs right under it. I mean, no enemy could just go, go through it. A lot of enemies were scared and they had a long history of that that they couldn't get through. But, but, so weak was the city inside, the history tells us that twice the enemies were able to get into a small spot in the wall where just a small group of people came in and they kept sneaking in and they were able to take down the whole city. You know, particularly there's a story um, when the Persians attacked, this is with King Cyrus. Um, They they failed to go in. They they went in with all their force. They couldn't get in. But during that time, during one of the the peace moments where they were kind of just besieging the city, a spy came across one soldier that was guarding and he dropped off his, he dropped his helmet off the, off the wall and the guy actually climbed down and picked it up and climbed back up the wall. And they're like, a weakness. So what they do, they, they all kind of funneled into that way. And the whole city was taken over. I mean, looking strong on the outside, but weak in the inner. And it seems that this deadness inside comes about when reputation or perception becomes a priority over what's in. And what's, going, and what's going on. Uh, and there is this ongoing disconnect between reputation and reality where we can put on a show while our souls are rotting inside. And I believe this is one of the greatest dangers of the church, right? Subtle, subtle, but can kill us. I mean, historically, the church has been known for very beautiful things. I mean, if you go to Europe, all the churches, all the cathedrals, I mean, they're amazing, like amazing. But it's, not, it's, it's common knowledge these days that so many of them are just empty these days. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, there was a great cathedral of Notre Dame that was destroyed by the fire, and according to Washington Post, they calculated that the rebuilding cost would be somewhere around $700 million, not including tax. Well, people were completely shocked. There's a twist to it. When the cathedral was able to receive pledges up to $1 billion in donations, coming from the most wealthiest people in, in France, Louis Vuitton, you know, that family being one of them. And, the, you know, the president of France was like, yo, we're going to build it more beautiful than ever. And this actually brought like a mini, mini uproar within the city, you know, considering that um, there are so many people that live below the poverty line and they're like, oh, you know, they're just wasting money. And we've been trying for years and years to raise money for, you know, the, 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 the Christians that are in Iraq who are being persecuted and those suffering in Yemen, which are going through the, the worst drought ever. And, you know, they're saying they're, they're, they're receiving criticism. And for sure, I think the donors have great, generous hearts. I mean, no matter what criticism, it's not easy to give money that much money to any type of cause, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. You can't just do that. It does show a generous heart. 
but it does often show what humanity, not just that, but humanity as a whole, what we tend to value, beauty over things. And if we're honest, we're not that different. Think about what we invest in. But what Christ is talking about in our text, I'm not even trying to go that way. It's actually deeper than that, deeper than that. This is not a sermon about, oh, shallow external beauty versus doing good things for people and having a, having a good heart or that type of way. It's not an attempt to say that Sardis didn't do good things. They certainly did. Remember, the church in Sardis, it said that they had a good reputation within the city. They probably did a lot of good things. They probably gave. They were generous. They helped the poor. But our text does say this. Despite all that, it was incomplete. It was unfinished in the sight of God. It falls short. It's not enough. I mean, check out verse two. It says this. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Now, this is really significant. You know, our text is not saying the outer things don't matter. It's not saying your reputation is, is all wrong or it's not important. It's not saying all that. Also saying is that alone is incomplete. Not enough. But why? You know, let's see what that means. I mean, there are a couple areas that the church can become dead like Sardis, where a reputation, where they have a reputation for being alive, but are actually dead inside. And it actually starts from the hearts of its member within their relationship with God, and then it begins to move out with the church and its relationship with the world. It can happen in both ways. First, let me talk about the first one. It starts from the heart. It does. It starts from our relationship with God. A church becomes dead when when what we do on the outside for God becomes more important than our actual relationship to him. We're all the things that we do for God. We serve him. We do all of that, but we don't have a relationship to him. A relationship is dead when a relationship is simply defined by outer actions, doing things rather than the heart involved. I mean, this is true, right? In other words, it is a subtle belief that the Christian life is all about how we impress God with what we do for them rather than having a real relationship built in love with trust, obedience, submission, and coming to him over and over again. You know, there's two different types of people in the church that fall into this type of way. One is those that haven't heard the gospel that well. They kind of heard it on surface level. But two, it's for those in the church that have heard this message before, but after some time, they forget. My gosh, this is me. I forget all the time. First and foremost, I want to say this, and I say it all the time, but it's so important. Christianity is not about religion, rituals, or even moral living, but it's all about a relationship with God that gives meaning to all that we do. This means that more than what we do, God cares more about who we are to him. You know, I bet you nine times out of 10, if you go up to someone who grew up as a Christian who, or who is a Christian, who claims to be a Christian, and you ask them about what faith is and how one gets to heaven and how one receives favor from God, Nine times out of ten, they're going to be like, yo, you know, I try to be good. I do things, you know, and I think God might like me because of that. Sometimes I'm shocked because even those that have gone through church and hearing the gospel their whole life will say this. But the truth is this cannot be a determining factor because in reality, I mean, think about it. You can do a bunch of good things without having your heart in it. You can do a lot of good things whether or not you believe God or not. So it's important to know that God cares far more about who you are to him than what you do for him. It's not about the reputation we have with God, but the relationship. And if we don't have that, we're like Sardis. But let me ask you, let me guys ask you guys a quick question. What do you think really impresses God? What impresses God? Is it our killer good looks? Is it our smiles? Is it our generous hearts? How much we serve the church? I mean, what really impresses God? Or better yet, let me ask you, can we really impress him? You know, the word impress is really interesting. You know, the longer I live, and maybe some of you people in this room might be able to understand what I'm talking about. The longer you live, aren't, isn't being impressed really hard? I mean, you know, when I was younger, like you would watch the corniest action movies and you thought it was the greatest thing in the world. But these days, I don't even go to, I don't even go to movie theaters. It's all the same. I'm not that impressed. You know how many movies are made but never make it to the movie theater? It's not that impressive. Even the ones that are there are not that impressive. But, I mean, think about this. I mean, it, but, but now imagine a God who has seen everything under the sun, 
everything for eternity. He saw all goodness, saw all the charity of the world, saw all the service, saw all the works of the saints, saw all the things that Apostle Paul and Peter did, saw all everybody, sees you in your past, present, and the future. What can you really impress him with? Can we do it with our reputation? I mean, what can we bring to him? You know, do we bring to him our goodness and be like, yo, God, look, look at all the goodness I brought. You know what it's like? It's like going to Jeff Bezos and be like, yo, I, I, I donated $100. What's up to your company? Aren't you impressed? But then again, there is a sense that no matter how old things get, we are impressed with certain things in life when it comes from people that we actually have a relationship with. Love impresses us. I mean, it's timeless. Because the people we love, we actually look for ways that they impress us. I mean, tell me not. I mean, I mean, think about it. Why are we impressed with the first walking steps of our grandchildren or our children or our nieces or nephews? Oh my gosh, it's not like they're, they're walking or strutting that well. I mean, they kind of suck at walking at that point. Why are we impressed with their first words or the first song they sing? I mean, they're not American Idol. But why does it win our hearts? It's a relationship. And this tells us something. You know, the way to impress God is not but, but, but by what we actually do, but it's what type of relationship we, with, what type of relationship we have with them. And that makes everything else significant. And let me tell you, and this is what Christ is getting at. He was like, hey, Christ is saying, hey, Jesus Christ, me, I represent that relationship. I am the son of God and I make you a child of God in me. And not only that, Christ is the only one that can actually impress God because he has perfection. I mean, he's perfect. He's sinless. He followed everything that God, God wanted. And not only that, he's the son of God, perfect and related. I mean, you don't get better than that. And it's only in faith in him alone that we might even look a little impressive. In fact, he's very impressed because Christ becomes what he sees. And, you know, and this, this is very significant. Look at the way Jesus is introduced, and it points to this. Verse 1 says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This is really significant because the number seven always represents a number of, of, of fulfillment or completion. He's saying, I have the seven spirits of God. I'm full of God. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm exactly what he wants. But it moves on to say, I also have the seven churches in my hand. That means they also have my fullness because they're in me. He's saying, I have a completeness in the spirit that brings life. And that completeness is shared with the church. And you know, do you guys know what a dead relationship is? It's a relationship that looks good on the outside. Things are done really well but there's no connection. Jesus says he is that bridge to God, man. Church, my, God most definitely wants us to live good lives, to serve. He wants us to be generous. He wants us to care for the needs of others. He wants us to do all those good things. But that alone is not that impressive. It's not enough. That's why our text says, I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. And this is where we come back and say, yo, what we couldn't complete ourselves was finished in Christ. Amen? But that deadness can move on to the church and the world around, right? Our relationship with the world. The church can also become like Sardis when our reputation to the world becomes more important than preaching Christ. When our reputation to the world becomes more important than preaching Christ. You know, I came across a book that gave like shivers down my spine. It was like a paradigm shift. And, it, you know, it, it's so relevant to the, to, to the church of Sardis. A professor and a theologian that, that serves at uh, Westminster, Westminster Theological Seminary in California, there's one over there too, a guy named Michael Horton wrote a book called Christless Christianity. And in the first chapter, he starts off with a question like this. He says this. He says, what would things look like if Satan took over our city? What would it look like if it took over Philadelphia? Let me ask you guys, what would it look like? You're like, ah, oh, you talk, you know. <laughs> I think many of us would be like, yo, it'd be like terrorist ridden, ridden city. It'd be the worst one of all. You know, crimes and murders will be at the highest. It'd be prostitutes and drugs at every corner. You know, we're going to picture peep kids cursing on the streets and teenagers mugging and, 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 and you know, harassing people and, and the church is being burnt to the ground, right? Interesting. Because the art, or this book quoted a sermon from an old minister named named Donald Gray Barnhouse, who served at 10th Presbyterian Church in Center City, Philly. And he wrote this. 
He wrote, if Satan took over Philadelphia, all the bars would be closed, pornography been banished, pristine streets would be filled with tidy pedestrians who smile at each other. There would be no swearing. The children would say, yes, sir, no, ma'am. And the churches would be full every Sunday. But it would be a place where Christ is not preached. And I was like, oh, shoot. Like, no, he didn't. You know, I'm like, looking at this. I'm like, man, I got chills down my spine, you know? Because I, because I'm beginning to see how real this is. Because more and more, I see the, the the landscape of the church and the perception that we have of it. I mean, how many? How, how, is the church really known for Christ, or is the church known simply as a place where good deeds are promoted, and it's a place we want to take our kids because they might be a little bit better and well behaved after they go? While the actual robust message of Christ crucified for sinners is put aside. I mean, how many people actually believe that the church is simply there for, for, for these good things? You know, as a pastor that preaches every week, I know this so well. I mean, how easily, can, how, how easy it's to fall into this, you know? I can come up here and be like, yo, talk about the principles of the gospel. Yo, you got to love everybody, forgive, and say all those nice things and never mention a moment of repentance and, and, and sinners needing Christ. And you know, if I take that out, everybody says amen. They love it, you know? Everybody loves the words of the Bible, certain parts. But if we're honest about the, what the Bible actually talks about, it's far more interested in a covenant or what we call a relationship that humans have with God. And everything else, morality, all that, that comes out of it, you know? So much to the point where God is screaming through his prophets all throughout, you know, the prophetic books where he's saying, yo, it's more about the circumcision of the heart, the heart, not just the body. You know, circumcision later, it becomes what we call baptism, a similar sign that brings us into relationship with God. It's a sign, right? But you know what it's like? It's like having marriage without any of the love. Go through the motions. Live like a married couple, but there's nothing in there. But that's what the church, that's what the church of Sardis was missing. Maybe they were preaching a different message, I don't know. We preach about the good outer signs of a relationship with God without talking about what or who connects us to that heart. And you know, like, you know, you see it, you know, the message of the church towards that shift, towards being dead, it happens in such small ways, it really does. You know, I, you know, I, I, I fall to it all the time. I was like, we don't want to be offensive with the, the message of the Bible. So we pick and choose the messages that are comfortable to hear. We talk about love without talking about how that love was given. We talk about forgiveness and grace without talking about the cost of forgiveness and grace and the only way to receive it. We talk about morals, even biblical ones, used for the betterment of humanity. And certainly they do improve humanity, but without stating that there's a God who keeps us accountable at the end of time. I mean, the benefits of Christ without actually introducing Christ. And Michael Horton goes on to say, we care more about the reputation of the church as acceptable in the world rather than connecting them to the real thing. You know, it's no wonder people after hearing messages like this for so long, they like biblical ethics. They like everything about Christianity. They respect it as long as it's not exclusive to Christ. I mean, look at how many people love to talk about love and sacrifice, second chances, rescuing people, saving people not with Christ. And when we don't need Christ anymore, what we find is a culture of Christianity rather than the real thing that looks good on the outside, but at the end of time are dead. You know, we live in a very post-Christian world. I mean, especially in America, we're accustomed to hearing biblical principles everywhere. That's why, you know, we feel them, you know, it's like built into our constitution because they're built on biblical principles. I read a book not too long ago talking about how many quotes of the Bible are actually written in our Constitution in their founding documents. It's all over the place. Because even they realized that they couldn't promote a lot of these things without having a reference to God. But now it's just a reference, a means to an end. You know, there's a, a real truth. You know, a lot of times people think that Satan's main job or initiative is to make us bad people, destroy us, you know, um, or his biggest goal is to, 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 to break up our marriages, do things like that. The truth is, who doesn't care? He doesn't care. He doesn't care if you serve the church. He doesn't care if you're nice to people. As long as your souls are taken away from God. Because at the end, he knows, right? If souls are not connected to, to true goodness, to God, all that's going to burn out eventually anyway. People can only keep up an act for so long. 
You know, and I really do believe that we know these principles of love and relationship. We do. We know it to our bones. We know that good behavior doesn't really correlate one-to-one with the heart of love. We know it when people are acting nice, but they don't really care about us. We know it when we're being used rather than adored. My gosh, I mean, what if you were, what if you overheard a conversation of one of your close friends having with somebody else, and they had a conversation like this, oh, yeah, you know, I only like Paul because, you know, he, he's nice to have around, you know, and, you know, he gets a little annoying, so I might as well keep him around because I know it's good for me. He's a good influence, you know. It's better than not having him around. I'm only really doing it because it's good for me. I mean, even for me, like, I'm just, <laughs> all right. And pass yourself, smile at you, but I don't like you. But just to think, if God is real, he's a personable God who cares more about relationship and what happens in our heart rather than the things we do. What do you think he looks for in a church's message? And this is what I think he's pointing to in this, in the, in the, in this letter to Sardis. He's saying, you want to be alive? Wake up. It's not about principles. It's not about works. It's not just about a behavioral change. It's not about a reputation. I see those deeds, but it's incomplete. It's not about buying me flowers or doing the dishes. It's not about all the things you do for me. Yes, they can be nice. I'd rather you do it than not. But I need the love. I need the realness, the connectedness. And Christ says, if you want to be alive, then you have to know me. You know, verse 3, it says this. It says this, remember, therefore, What you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what time I will come to you. Let me, let me break this down. You know, what does this mean? Hold fast to what? Repent to who? You know, this is a common theme all throughout the letters. It keeps pointing back to Revelation chapter one, when Christ is introduced and his description is laid out, you know, a God who has all the churches in his hands. He's saying, look to me, look to me. Hold fast to me. Jesus is saying, return to me. Hold fast. Have a relationship with me. Love me. Because that's the only way you have a real connection with God. That's the only way you can truly be alive. Not only on the outside, but in the inside. And guys, this is what we hold fast to and preach. Because if we don't wake up to that, you know, we're going to face the end of time. We're going to think we did a bunch of good stuff. You know, the thief at the, at the, at, that comes when no one knows, that's always in reference to the end of time that creeps up. And just to think, right, all those who will think that they have done everything right to impress God, and they come and they come before his presence and be like, yo, God, look at all the stuff I've done. Look at that money that I gave to you. And just to think, what is the scariest moment if he said, I never knew you, never knew you. You know, let me read to you guys Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23. I mean, this is like the scariest book, of, I mean, like, passage of the Bible, you know, like gives me chills every time I look at it. He says this, verse 21 to 23 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven, a relationship. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Oh my gosh. It's basically saying, yo, all the things that you do, all the righteousness that you think you can muster up are nothing, are nothing when you're standing before a holy God. You know, let me ask you guys, you know, at the end of the time, you face God, the judge, what are you going to present to him? What are you going to present to him? Are you going to list all the good things you've done? church are we going to talk about all the great events that we've carried out i got a feeling god is going to look at it and be like no i'm not impressed who do you have in your heart who do you have in your heart you know it's so interesting how christ talks about clothes at the end this is so significant verse four to five says this yet you have a few people in sardis who have not soiled their clothes they will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Who are those that don't soil their clothes? The ones that hold fast to Christ. Why? Because the ones who have repented and cling on to Christ receive new clothes. 
and they walk with Christ in white. You guys know what the gospel is? It's Christ's righteousness that covers over us to make us worthy. His blood that washes us clean from our heart. And it simply comes from a moment of clinging on to him. You know, clothes often represents a reputation of a person. Back then, especially clothes, it represented status. It represented their style. It's a symbolic term that talked about how people saw you. It means reputation and things like that. But what Christ is saying is, yo, my reputation, my goodness, my righteousness, my status is going to be bestowed upon you in faith. This is why Galatians 3.27 says this, for all who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And guys, that opens up a place for us in heaven. That name is written in the book of life because it's written with Christ's name. And now no one can move that. You, you recognize it says that no one can erase that. That means we might fall apart. We might do things. Our, our actions might that be great. But our names are written in Christ. And we have the victory. And we'll never lose it. Let me ask you guys. Will you place your faith in him? Will you place your faith in him? Let's pray.